Hello, Knock Knock. Uh, we have a relatively short time. <laughs> uh, my name is Ron Herring, and I want to uh, introduce Keith Kluwer. And I'll just say a few things uh, about Keith, which is that he's exactly the kind of journalist that, that we desperately need uh, in this country. And I'll give you several examples. So uh, Keith has written the article breaking this issue of attacks on ag bioscientists uh, for Science Magazine. And it's, it's like this tiny article, 815 comments in science. And the way I met Keith is indicative of what I like about his style. So he, he, uh, he teaches at NYU, he's been there for 10 years, teaches at CUNY in New York City, science, journalism, that kind of thing, environmental journalism. So Keith um, called me about a conference we were putting on about agrarian crisis in India, and he sort of legs it up here, hangs out at the conference for two days, and keeps asking these really penetrating questions about what is this thing about epidemic of suicides in India, da 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 So then he writes this article for the um, <coughs> Issues in Science and Technology uh, the National Academy puts out. And he called me to see, am I getting this screwed up? To ask me if I had sort of steered him wrong? Is it, did I have things sort of basically right? And that kind of journalism that goes to the facts as Keith said yesterday, he doesn't want to get the story, he wants to get the story right. He doesn't want this to be about him, he wants to be about the story. So what we're going to hear today is the story of how cultural brokers are involved in influencing the GMO debate. Which is, of course, for those of you who don't know, because of course we teach uh, here at Cornell next fall. Uh, and so I introduce Keith, and with my great appreciation for being the kind of journalist he is. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ron. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you to Sarah and the Alliance for Science for uh, hosting me. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk here about, uh, I write a lot about how, you know, GMOs are covered in the media. I write about biotechnology for various publications. Um, but one of the things that's really been interesting to me is sort of tracking the conversation, how it's playing out in the media, how it's played out in the public sphere. So, in 2012, Michael Mann, um, prominent client scientist from uh, Penn State, he wrote about his experiences as a scientist caught up in the politics of climate change. Um, climate change, as many of you know, has been heavily politicized and scientists like Michael Mann have been unfairly attacked for their work. A year ago, uh, last year, Michael Mann, uh, he wrote this op-ed in the New York Times encouraging his colleagues to speak out about climate scientists. In the piece, he wrote, if scientists choose not to engage in the public debate, we leave a vacuum that will be filled by those whose agenda is one of short-term self-interest. Now, this is similar to something that he said to me recently for a story that I'm writing about the climate wars. So I've got, this is in my head. That's, I couldn't help but in, you know, use it for this talk today because it's in my head. It's what I'm writing about now, actually. This is what, so he said to me, if you're not engaged in the process of, cu of communicating the science and implication of climate change, you're going to leave a void. It's very similar to what he wrote. Now, what he means here is that others, perhaps those who don't see any worrisome implications of climate change, they will more than gladly fill that void. There's a, uh, a pretty good documentary out about this called The Merchants of Doubt right now, uh, based on a book by um, science historians, uh, based on their book by the same title. Now, I would say there's, there is no communication void in the climate debate. If you follow that, you know that it's, pretty, it's a pretty robust discussion and all, you know, every, every side is, is represented there. One of the most successful um, climate communicators is the journalist uh, Bill McKibben. Now, McKibben authored in 1989 uh, what is considered to be the most popular book on climate change called The End of Nature anybody's read it, but it really was, it sort of put it on, out there into the public. Uh, since then, McKibben's various books and magazine articles on the dangers of, of climate change, and he's published widely in, in Rolling Stone and, and all the prestige publications, um, they've, they've really influenced the climate discourse. So, so uh, Bill McKibben has is, is played a big role in that. And there was this paper that was written by Matthew Nisbet in 2013 that examined McKibben's role as what 
Nisbet calls him a, a knowledge journalist. This is what Nisbet writes, knowledge journalists in popular discussion remain loosely identified as celebrity authors who trade in big ideas, coin trends, drive book sales, and inspire movements. Other influential knowledge journalists that Nisbet discusses in his paper are Thomas Friedman, uh, the New York Times op-ed columnist, and Michael Pollan, who we're gonna talk about in, in a few minutes. Now Nisbet in this paper, he quotes two sociologists, Ronald Jacobs and Eleanor Townsley from a book that they co-authored a few years ago. And here's what they said. Studying who these communicators are and what cultural practices they use in their debates is just as important as identifying the range of relevant facts that news media do or do not provide. So we can also, we can think of these public intellectuals as knowledge brokers, you know, people who help frame arguments, political and policy discussions. Now, I was talking about these knowledge brokers recently with Ron Herring, a professor of political science here at Cornell. And, you know, when he, he mentioned a similar discussion he had with a student of his um, about sort of the role of, of uh, knowledge brokers, cultural brokers, however you want to call them. And he, you know, he said that uh, one of the students that, that was talking to him says, well, they're not really knowledge brokers. Uh, she characterized these kinds of influential communicators as cultural brokers. That term really struck me. I remember when I heard that from Ron, it really just sort of jumped, you know, really uh, resonated with me as perhaps capturing a term that really captured what, what this is here, this, this role that these thought leaders, I mean, they're thought leaders is really what we're talking about here. So I, I thought it was apt, and I stole it for the title of this talk. I don't know, if the, is that student here? I would love for her to take credit for that. Her name is Jennifer. Are you here, Jennifer? No. Okay. Well, anyway, I just wanted to, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is all by way of an introduction, a preface, to say if Bill McKibben is a knowledge broker, if he is a cultural broker, if he is an example of a popular environmental communicator, with, especially you know, with respect to climate change, who would be his equivalent in the GMO debate? Who would be Bill McKibben's equivalent in the GMO debate? Now, we could make an argument for Greenpeace, right? Greenpeace is, you know, that's the international environmental group that has long been a staunch opponent of GMOs, and they certainly have um, helped, probably to a great degree, frame the discussion on GMOs with their opposition. They're very active around the world. They organize protests, and in some cases, they actually go and rip up crops, you know, test crops, you know, in some of these countries, and we've read about that. Not going to get into that too much. For the purposes of this talk, I'm thinking more of an individual, not so much of an organization. I'm thinking of, you know, someone who's invested with moral authority, um, as environmental guardians are, someone like Bill McKibben. Um, what popular activist, prolific writer, charismatic voice has framed GMO discussion in the media? Well, let's start with Vandana Shiva. Vandana Shiva, for those of you, uh, probably many of you are already familiar with her, she's one of the original uh, tree huggers, uh, an Indian-born, globe-trotting environmental activist. She's uh, become very prominent in the last several decades. She really sort of is on the circuit talking about the environment and, and uh, GMOs, which we'll get into in a second. Um, you know, I just like this, this picture, too. There's two tree stumps, not one. Now, like Bill McKibben, Shiva is, is an advocate for nature, and, and that's certainly how she's come to be seen. So there's also, I think, in part of this, sort of a quasi-spiritual element. You know, I, I love this headline. Can you see it? What would nature do? In this one, in this magazine cover, she's, you know, she gets on... I think, she's all, I think Shiva was also named one of Time's uh, environmental champions, uh, green champions in, in the early 2000s. It helps if you're going to be a cultural broker like Shiva. It helps to be a prolific author of books that have a theme. Um, Shiva is considered to be an eco-feminist. She's a champion of the downtrodden. She's a champion of biodiversity, of nature. And in the 1990s, for those of you who followed um, the globalization. I think she really established herself as sort of this global presence with her anti-globalization um, talks. Now, Shiva also gets interviewed a lot on TV. Here she is in France being interviewed about GMOs. And often, you know, in the last 10 years, you know, as much as she talks about other environmental issues, she's really always circling back to GMOs. And 
This one was about cotton has become the seat of slavery. That sort of gives a hint of where we're going. It helps if you have cachet, if you, if it helps to be a real popular speaker, and, and Shiva is. She's a very, she's a really a, a great polished speaker, and she delivers talks at culturally important institutions, universities, museums. It seems like she's always on the move somewhere. And um, here she is a couple of years ago talking at one of my favorite places. She gave this annual keynote address on sustainability at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, which is in my backyard. So I attended this talk, and I, and I, will, you know, I was curious. I had, around this time a couple of years ago, I had started wading into you know, some of the issues that Vandana Shiva had been uh, talking about for years. And so it, it helped to actually go see her in person. And it was great. It was convenient, right in my backyard. Um, and it helps to be a, co uh, a compelling storyteller if you're going to be a cultural broker. And, and Vanda, Vandana Shiva really is. She's a great storyteller. One of the stories that uh, Shiva has told over and over again for the last decade, and she told it that day at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, is the story of how more than 250,000 Indian farmers have killed themselves because of GMOs. How many of you heard this story? A lot of hands have gone up. Wow. So it's gone out, it's out there. It's a story that many have heard. And in fact, I have friends that have taught, and I mentioned this to uh, a, a friend in Brooklyn, I think I was, when I was working on a story related to this, who knew nothing about GMOs. I said, I'm working on this story about Indian farmers and, you know, uh, and, you know committing suicide, and, and, and it has to do with GMOs. He's like, I heard, he's like, I heard about that story. I, and he knew nothing about GMOs, but he heard about that story. So it's, it's really interesting how it's sort of penetrated in that way. Now the story goes like this. For those of you who are not familiar with the Indian farmers that have committed suicide, usually by drinking pesticide after they get into debt. They are, these are uh, small scale farmers. And Shiva has attributed this, and this is her word, genocide. She calls it a genocide. She's attributed this genocide to genetically modified cotton seeds uh, made by Monsanto. Now it's a very tricky, complicated story. Uh, because many, because in fact, you know, many thousands of small-scale Indian farmers actually have tragically taken their own lives in the last several decades. But you should know also that that this phenomena predates when GMOs were actually introduced. GMO cotton was introduced to India. But the gist of it is that you know th these farmers there in this country they don't have access to bank loans the way American farmers do. They don't have access to crop insurance. They don't have that. If a monsoonal rains or a bad drought comes in and wipes out their crop, they're not getting compensation for that. I mean, I mean there's been some policies in recent years that the government has actually stepped in to try to rectify this. But, but for, for a while, it's not, you know, that they just didn't have that. And, and also, these, these crops are planted on, uh, many of them are on marginal lands. And so they don't have access to irrigation as well. So there's, you know, they're, it's, they're, they're on the margins there. So many of these um, farmers that have, um, you know, embraced genetically modified cotton, some of them, in, in, they go to these money lenders. You know, since they can't go to a bank, they go to these money, money lenders and charge really exorbitant interest rates. And then if something goes wrong with the crop and they don't get the yield that they have or, or the, the farmers maybe use the money for other purposes besides the crop, there's, there's, a, whole, there's a host of... of, of socio-cultural reasons that are part of this story that I'm really, I don't have time to get into. It's, it's complicated, but I encourage you to actually read up on it if you can. Because it's not just, it's not a matter of uh, Indian farmers, you know, turning to genetically modified cotton, which is what Shiva has um, contended for a number of years. Um, it's much more complicated than that. However, if you have a saintly image, like Vandana Shiva, um, your story often is sort of taken at face value. Michael Spector writes in The New Yorker, he wrote a, a profile on her last year, and one of the way he described her is she's been called the Gandhi of grain and compared to Mother Teresa. That's, that's, that's um, you know, you're invested with serious moral authority there. So when someone like Vandana Shiva talks about these Indian farmers, the plight of Indian farmers, you know, it gets traction. It gets out there. And... It helps to, you know, it helps when you tell your story to, you know, these influential journalists, people like Bill Moyer. She said this was a, this was a couple of years ago. Um, Bill Moyer, who calls her in this episode a rock star. A lot of the uh, journalists that have interviewed her are, are fairly fawning 
They really look at her as somebody who's out there doing this work and helping to save the planet, and, and they don't really challenge um, much of what she says. And I would, I've argued in, in some pieces that, that Bill Moyers you know, sort of fell down on the job here. And so The Farmer Suicides is a story she's told over and over again to audiences, public audiences, on TV. But it's not just Vandana Shiva. This is a story, it's not really, you know, one person doesn't do it alone. So she has help from the media. This is 2008, a story from the Daily Mail in the UK. Prince Charles is a big fan of Vandana Shiva, and he heard about this from her, and then he gets on it. Then there's this story that appears where this reporter supposedly goes out there and you know, verifies that, yes, in fact, this is, this is happening. Uh, it's even worse. It's even worse than Vandana Shiva's you know, been saying. So uh, this story has gone global. This story, this story really helped the Suicide Seeds uh, meme take hold, I would argue. Um, and, you know, she's interviewed. Here it is. On, here she is a couple years ago being interviewed on CNN. A film director made two movies in a, in, in the, during the 2000s about globalization. Around 2009, 2010, he found himself sitting on a panel uh, at a film festival with Vandana Shiva. Because, you know, when you're a cultural broker, you, you go on the circuit to these film festivals, too. <laughs> and so he's there with her, and um, I guess they were talking about his movies and, and globalization. And I think afterwards, uh, he mentioned to her that he was looking for another globalization angle. He had already done two movies, and he's got a, he had a planned trilogy. And so he recalled the conversation that he had with Vandana Shiva. And here it is. She said, you should come to India for your third one, the third movie. And I told her, well, actually, that's kind of what I had in mind. But what do you got? And she said, the farmer suicide crisis. Every 30 minutes, a farmer kills himself. And I thought, she must be exaggerating because I had never heard of it. So I started investigating and I asked her, what's the globalization angle? And she told me, it's because of the seeds that Monsanto sells. And three months later, I went to India and she made the arrangements for me to meet people and to start traveling around. I thought that was very convenient, by the way, that she set that whole thing up for him to do. Um, and so what, what resulted? We have this movie, Bitter Seeds, that resulted, that actually uh, was screened here when I was at that conference several years ago on, on this issue. And it's a really affecting movie. It's a very poignant movie, and it, it really pretty much follows the Vandana Shiva storyline. And you can see the headline, every 30 minutes a farmer in India kills himself. I'm not going to get into the whole movie, but um, you know, I encourage people to see it for themselves. It's, 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 a, it's a very well done, well done movie that certainly has a point of view. Um, now, the reviews come in very shortly after the movie's released. This is at Grist, uh, a, a widely read uh, environmental uh, website. A Bitter Seeds documentary reveals the tragic tolls of GMOs in India. And, and that is what some of the other reviews had said. You, the reviews were um, pretty much just taking the movie, taking uh, the claims that were made in the movie at face value. And um, so, a couple of years, it's been now a couple of years since this has happened. Since then, a number of journalists, myself included, have taken a much closer look at this GMO uh, farmer Indian suicide story. Here's a, a piece in The Economist, GM genocide. And that was from, yeah, last year. Here's a story from the National Post, the myth of India's GM uh, genocide. Here's a story I wrote where I deconstructed uh, Shiva's uh, role in this. And, uh, and then also examining the help she got from, from journalists and cultural brokers. So we're moving on now to the next cultural broker. Try Not to Miss Bitter Seeds, a powerful documentary on farmer suicides and biotech seeds in India. Now, when someone like Michael Pollan endorses a movie like this, it's like Michael Jordan endorsing sneakers. Now, I, I may be dating myself a little with that reference, but you get the picture, right? That's a, that's a pretty big endorsement. Pollan has enormous credibility. He writes widely read books about how we should eat and reform agriculture and the food system and how to make the food system more uh, sustainable. You've got here, you'll hear some of his best selling books. You know, he's so popular that when there was a debate at Berkeley last year, Pamela Ronald, a, a plant geneticist at the University of California, went to speak there. And, you know, usually this is not a big deal. You know, somebody goes and talks at a university. This is written up in the New Yorker. Why? Because it's Michael Pollan. Now, Pollan 
it's because he's known as a skeptic of GMOs. He doesn't believe that enough independent food safety studies have been done. He believes that GMOs perpetuate industrial agriculture, particularly monocultures. And so, you know, such is his reputation. His, his critique is taken so seriously that, you know, what he thinks is written up in the New Yorker, you know, this debate that he's having with another scientist. Now, I need to mention this story by Amy Harmon because it, it sort of speaks to his influence. It's a great story uh, from a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times. She, it's a deeply absorbing, comprehensively reported story about the effort to save the Florida orange from uh, this fungal blight. She weaves this story about how there's a race to save the orange and, and how all these other conventional efforts are failing and now the, the, the citrus guys, the citrus industry is reluctantly turning to biotechnology. The story's got nothing to do with Monsanto. Many in the science journalism community love the piece. It goes on to win numerous awards, including a prize from the National Association of Science Writers. And here was Michael Pollan's response. Important New York Times story on GM oranges, too many industry talking points and brings in the Monsanto angle. Amy was not happy with this. I reported on a threat to oranges and potential GMOs, so a cop out to dismiss it as industry propaganda. You have to respond. Michael, if Michael Pollan's dissing your article in the New York Times, you've got to respond to it, because it's Michael Pollan. <laughs> Many others, scientists and journalists alike, started to weigh in, expressing their displeasure with Pollan. Here's Michael Eisen, you know, really getting pissed off. And then we have Carl Zimmer jumping in, he, uh, explaining why, why uh, the critique is unfair. He said it has too many industry talking points, a harsh accusation from one journalist to another. And here is uh, Zimmer again explaining to another journalist, an editor, he, 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 why. He's explaining, this is why it's important. This is why you know, we're, I'm paying attention to this and, and my, my colleagues are paying. Because he has over 300,000 followers. You got to take, you, you know, this is why we, you know, we have to answer to this. So that's why so much attention. It gets such traction, it plays out over a couple of days that the Columbia Journalism Review does a story on it. <laughs> the talking points that launched 1,000 tweets. If you, <laughs> it really is, like 1,000 tweets. You, have, you scroll through it, you'll see it's, it was incredible. People were just arguing for days over this. Here is what Amy Harmon said in Grist. Gr uh, Nate Johnson wrote a piece for Grist about it. She writes, in terms of the broader reaction, I think it's a testament to Michael Stature as a journalist and as a critic of industrial agriculture. So when he says something, people believe him. This is the same case. This is how it is with Vandana Shiva. She has a certain stature in the social justice and the green communities. When she says something, people tend to believe her. A cultural broker has this exalted status. There are other kinds of cultural brokers in the GM debate. Bill Maher, I don't know if we, we, we only have like 10 minutes left. I don't know if I have time to play this. I think we, I would encourage you to watch this. He goes on a rant against GMOs and Monsanto. Calls uh, Monsanto the seat of evil. It would, be, it would be amusing to watch, but I want to save time. Now, who are some other cultural brokers? I would say Jane Goodall, right? I mean, th this is a beloved scientist. I mean, there, are, um, there might be some of you, I know scientists who were, were inspired by her to get into science. So here she is, this is recently, this is a book she's, she's promoting about the, uh, about, about the fraud, the scientific fraud over GM, about GM science. And here's a, a recent daily email, I love this title, Senior Academic. So that's an interesting way to refer to her. So, you know, I don't know if we can make a strong case for them, but they play a role in this debate. I mean, they have standing, they have very, very strong standing um, in society. So I would say, you know, who else might be a, a cultural broker? What about uh, Bill Nye, the science guy? Um, Nye is considered a science warrior. He takes on creationists. He takes on climate change denialists. He's out there. He's on TV. He's a pop culture figure, very popular uh, children's TV show. He's beloved. People love him. They love what he does. And it happens to be that Bill Nye, for a time, was a GMO skeptic. And um, he went on this, this piece I wrote um, in the fall after Bill Nye went on Reddit the, 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 to talk about his new book. And a questioner had noted that Nye had in the past played up um, unsubstantiated health and environmental concerns about GMOs. 
was Nye still worried about GMOs? The commenter wanted to know. He wrote, I stand by my assertions that although you can know what happens to any individual species that you modify, you cannot be certain what will happen to the ecosystem. He also said a bunch of other things about GMOs, you know, conflating it with, you know, with industry. Um, and this vague ecological concern that he expresses um, was al is also um, written about. He's a, got a chapter on GMOs in his, in, his recent, in his new book called Undeniable. After this came out, after I wrote about this, this got tons of comments and traffic. Uh, other bloggers, other science bloggers picked up on it uh, and really taking him to task for what they considered to be unscience-like talk from, from the science guy. And in fact, one scientist, uh, Kevin Falter from the University of Florida, challenged Bill Nye to a debate. He says, let's have this debate. You want to talk about the science, let's talk about it. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to sort of, you know, Kevin Falter wanted to set him straight, you know, or, or hear his concerns. And he, uh, Bill Nye never responded to that directly, um, but something must have happened because Bill Nye has changed his tune about the safety of GMOs. Now, I want to play this. This is a very fun clip. Bill Nye, the science guy. It's about genetically modified food. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. And I have revised my outlook, and I'm very excited about telling the world. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. Let's change the world. So, <laughs> This is a really fun, uh, fun, it's a fun play off of a conversation that Nye had a, apparently a, f a few weeks ago backstage at the Bill Maher show. It was in India, it, the, this video, the video of Bill, Nye, of Bill Nye, you can see it on YouTube, went, uh, went out and I picked up on it and um, other people wrote about it. It's like, whoa, wow, Bill Nye's changed his mind. Now, this is very curious, uh, what changed his mind? Here's Bill Nye, these are all Monsanto scientists. Here is um, Fraley, the chief scientist for, for Monsanto, posing next to him. He's in the seat of evil. <laughs> He's at Monsanto. Somehow, Bill Nye went to Monsanto, and he got a tour there of the facility, talked to the scientists, which is great. I think that's, I mean, Bill Nye had concerns about corporate influences of, you know, of the biotech industry, you know, and, you know, he want, I, I'm, more power to him. He goes right to the place. He goes right to where the belly of the beast, you know, where everybody sort of focuses on Monsanto. At first, I thought it was a stupid move. I thought, why? Why do that? Everyone's just going to say you were bought off by Monsanto. You're a Monsanto shill. But then I thought about it some more. I thought, well, you know, that's pretty clever, actually. If you're going to take the issue head on, go right to the place. Like, so, so actually, I give him a lot of credit for doing that. I would still wish he would have debated Kev Kevin Falta or went to, you know, some academics, you know, that didn't have any any uh, connection to, to Monsanto or industry. So he does that. So, you know, this, this tweet goes out. One of the bloggers, one of the writers at Mother Jones, who is very, very sort of, you know, skeptical of, of uh, biotechnology, you know, had the same sort of take that a lot of us did, which is, you know, what did Monsanto show Bill Nye to make him fall in love? Because Bill Nye in that video I was just talking about says, you know, he, he, he was just so exuberant. Like he found, he saw something that just changed his mind, that rocked his world. And, he said he wants to share it with the world. So what was interesting to me about Bill Nye having this uh, change of heart or change of mind about GMOs is if he was that excited about it, he would just want to talk about it now. He would run a, write an essay and publish it at the New York Times or somewhere. Um, instead, he said in the, in the backstage interview, he said that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for this, look for this news, look for the change, look for what I say in the next edition of my book next year. So I kind of, I'm a little cynical about that, and some others are as well. I kind of feel like, you know, let's just get out with it. You know, you have, you know, you're, you are this important figure. What you, there is, I don't know, can you see it here? 4,713 4, comments on a blog post. You know, uh, Ron talked about the over 800 comments on an 800-word story that I wrote at Science Magazine. I don't think, I don't know if Science Magazine's ever gotten more than a couple of dozen comments on any article. But on the GMO story from a few weeks ago that I wrote, they get 800 comments, 5,000 comments here. So Bill, it's, it's, there's, there's enormous interest in this topic. There's enormous interest in the issue. Bill Nye 
is somebody that people pay attention to. He's like Michael Pollan. What he says, people care about. What he says matters. It, it shapes that I care about it. I write about what he talks about. You know, as somebody in the media, I'm writing about, you know, Bill Nye. Because he's important. He's this central figure now. He's this pop culture figure in, in, in our society. So he has this sway. He has this influence. And so it, it really shows when you see the 5,000 comments on a blog post about Bill Nye just changing his mind. You know, so it's, uh, I, I think it behooves him to actually come out with it sooner, to let us know. I think he could help, you know, uh, be a constructive voice in the debate. We, why should we have to wait for the, for the next book to come out? Um, so, in closing, I'm just gonna, I just want to say that I think that um, you know people like uh, Bill Nye and Michael Pollan and Vandana Shiva. I I I I think that you know I I've given you examples of how you know of what what they say gets out there. People pay attention to it. If Michael Pollan makes a critique of a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter story that the science journalism community loves. People are arguing over that. They want to know what's, what's the beef? What, what is the problem? And, and then that becomes that, that articles, you know, uh, articles flow from that. Um, so what these, what these guys, you know, what, what these people say really matters. And, and they do shape the conversation for better and worse. They really do. And so that's why, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it has to be looked at. Just like, you know, there are leading voices in the climate change debate. There are people, there are leading voices that actually shape the conversation there. We have the same thing here in the GMO discourse. We have these thought leaders, these knowledge brokers, or these cultural brokers, shaping our conversation. So, you know, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, and I think that people are starting to pay much closer attention to what they say. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you.